From the last video, you already have a basic theoretical understanding of commit and reveal schemes, and we have implemented some of the building blocks that will be needed to recreate them. One thing we haven't done so far is creating the actual functions themselves. So for example, there is no commit function, there is no reveal function, and one thing that's also missing is a function that allows you to end the auction and come up with a resolution. Additionally, another thing we have to look into are storage locations. So for example, storage, memory, and call data. And that is exactly what we will do right now. All right, let's get started. So the first thing we will do is we are migrating a function that is needed for the commit step. So basically a way for people to submit their bits in a hidden form. And as an input um, to commit their bit in the hidden form, we use, of course, the hashed sealed bit. So the hash value that we get from all the inputs we looked, in, uh, looked up in the last video. Uh, our tasks, number one is we have to create a new bit object. And then number two, we have to add the new bit to the sender's list of bits. So a sender, as you will see later on, can potentially have several bits. Uh, so we will use an array here, an array of structs, and we have to add it to that array for a specific address. So what does it look like? Well, the function we're creating is called uh, bit right here. And uh, as a parameter, as a function argument, we have a uh, uh, bytes 32 with the uh, parameter name sealed bit, the function is external of course it's payable because we have to send some message value alongside and actually is the bit the value of the bit and then what we're doing right here is we have a bit struct so that's the struct we've defined last time um, it's a new bit and it is defined as one of these bit structs where sealed bit um, assumes the parameter value from right here so whatever we input as sealed bit in the function and the deposit is the message value so whatever is sent alongside we will come back to memory on the next slides um, that's something that's super important that we will discuss properly but right here you just have to realize that there actually is memory as storage location set all right so when we have that what we're doing is we're storing this new bit in the struct array of the specific address so right here you have bits uh, for a given address and that's basically uh, a mapping where you have an address as the key and then you end up on a struct array and then with push we just push the new bit value to that struct array of this specific address okay so when, you, when, a, when an address only has one bit then of course it's only this one value but since one address could have potentially speaking multiple bits uh, we have to store that in a in an array, an array of structs, structs because there are always multiple values stored, uh, as you can see uh, right uh, here. Uh, so the sealed bit and a deposit for each bit. That's the basic idea, okay? And that's the way it is stored. And push recall is just you add this to the end of the array. So essentially you're creating a new element at the end of the array um, where you're saying, okay, we have this additional, uh, in this case, struct here, and uh, it's gonna be stored on the blockchain. All right, so let's look at the storage or data location. And we have already talked about that several times, uh, also on the last slide, where I had to specifically specify the storage location for the bit object. What's important to understand is that whenever you have a struct or arrays, and that is includes, including strings, which are essentially just byte arrays, and they can exist in three different locations. And you have to explicitly specify where they exist. Number one, it's just memory. And when you're and you specify it as memory, then it's neither written nor read from the blockchain, and it only exists in the current scope. So you can think of it a little bit as uh, it being stored in the RAM. You can use it in the current scope for any operations, but when you specify it as memory, then it will not be stored on the blockchain uh, afterwards, okay? That's the basic idea. So you, you, whenever you change anything about that variable, it will not be written back to the blockchain. The changes are temporary. The changes are just applicable in the current scope. But when you're not storing it, when you're not using a storage location, uh, then it will not be stored on the blockchain. 
The second thing is something, well, it's somewhat of a special case, and it's not used that often. It's called call data. And it's for all practical purposes, especially in the context of this clause, it's quite similar to memory. Uh, what's important to understand is that call data can only be used for function arguments in external function calls, and that it is not modifiable. So whenever you have a parameter in an external function, then of course this parameter um, is there for you to use in the context and the scope of this of this uh, uh, function execution, and it is stored in a non-modifiable way in this storage that's called call data. Now the difference to memory is when you, when it's when you say when you specify it as memory, then it would be stored in a modifiable way, and this process of copying it to memory uh, consumes some gas, of course. So when you have something that's in production, when you have something where it's super important that you can optimize it in terms of efficiency, in terms of gas consumption, then in many cases it can make sense to use call data instead of memory when we're talking about function arguments for external functions. But uh, to be uh, honest, I mean, it's it's somewhat of a, a, an edge case. It's something you will only ever stumble upon when you're looking for gas optimization. And it's something that you do not necessarily need just for this class. But something you certainly need is storage. And storage is whenever you're loading something or whenever you're writing on the blockchain. Um, so it's your, you could also look at the, uh, that's the default operation whenever you want to store something. Uh, and the main disadvantage of uh, storage as a as a of as a storage location uh, is of course that it's extremely expensive. Whenever you're reading something from the blockchain, whenever you're writing something to the blockchain, especially, then it is relatively expensive. It will consume a lot of gas, and in that regard, whenever you can avoid it, so whenever you do not have to write to the blockchain, then you shouldn't do that. For example, when you have uh, multiple steps and in each step you're changing something about the same variable it wouldn't make too much sense to write it to the blockchain after every single step it could make much more sense if you just keep it in memory and then at the end uh, write to the blockchain but you have to be really careful um, i mean you can there can many things there can be many things that could go wrong when you're just using memory uh, so especially when you're starting out to create your smart contracts and these efficiency considerations aren't that important. It may make much more sense to uh, default to storage in many cases. Okay, but these are the differences. This is memory call data and storage, and especially memory and storage are super important for you to understand. A good heuristic, as I said, is use storage if you want to load or modify a state variable, use memory otherwise and call data is basically just for gas optimization and something uh, that will help you when you're uh, programming um, for, for produ productive environments, when you're really developing your own protocols and you want them to use a mainnet, then you have to, of course, to, you have to do things like that. But otherwise, it's not that important. Now, let's think about what the re real function needs to do. Recall that earlier we did the commit function. Now let's tackle the reveal function. And there are certain steps. Number one, of course, it has to accept a list of unencrypted bits to reveal. Uh, so basically, you have to allow the user to specify um, uh, certain bits to say, hey, that's what I committed earlier. And when this, when this list is there, then of course, you have to validate that the length of this list corresponds to the number of committed bits. So that whatever you have, whatever this user, whatever this address has committed earlier, uh, actually course is, is corresponding to whatever uh, he or she tries to reveal right now. And then number three, check if the reveal period is selective. Of course, when we are already uh, at the end of the auction, um, you, you shouldn't be able to reveal it anymore, then it should fail. Number four, compute the hash values and compare them to the commit hash values. So to make sure that whatever um, this person has committed earlier actually corresponds to what they are revealing right now. Number five, ignore any fake bits. Number six, update the highest bit and the highest bidder if applicable. So whenever there is a, a new leader, so to speak, whenever somebody has the new highest bit, then you have to update that. And number seven, handle refunds related to the reveal mechanism. So 
to make things more readable, make it easier to understand, we split the logic into two parts. So number one, we have an update bit that handles the bit related checks and refunds. And then we have a second function, which we call reveal that handles all the reveal related checks and refunds. And then we split that, then of course it's much easier to understand. It's much easier also to maintain the function. And it's usually a good idea that when you have things that can be separated logically, when you also do that in the functions, and when you also do that with the functions, so that you have separated functions for these things that can be separated logically. So update bits is actually quite similar to the simple, simple auctions um, bit function we have seen earlier. The function is internal, meaning that it can only be called from the contract itself. You will see why later on, because it's essentially triggered by another function. But this other function uses the update bits function uh, internally. And it returns true if the new bit is accepted as the highest bit and false otherwise. So you have this result of one or zero that says, okay, one, if we actually have to uh, update the highest bit and zero if we do not have to do that. Let's look into the code. And uh, we have this new function right here. So it's the update bit function. It takes the bidder address. It takes a bid amount, UINT bid amount. Uh, it's an internal function as I have said, so it cannot be called uh, by a, a NEOA or external contracts. It returns um, Boolean value, which we call success. So that's just the one or a zero. And here we go with if the bid amount that has been specified is smaller equal to the highest bid, then return false because then we don't have a new highest bidder. Then the old highest bid will remain to be the uh, current highest bid. If the highest bidder is not equal to the uh, zero address, then that's, that means that we currently have somebody who is in the lead that is not the first highest bidder, then refund the, excuse me, refund the previously highest bidder. Then you have the pending returns for this highest bidder address. And we add the highest bid to whatever already has been specified here. This should be also quite familiar. We did that before. So it's basically just updating what this person that used to be the highest bidder after this transaction is executed, um, what the, whatever this person can withdraw. There might be already uh, some pending returns and that's why we're adding the highest bid to that value. If there are no pending returns for this address, uh, then we just start at zero and whatever has been stored as the highest bid uh, earlier. So basically before this transaction uh, will be stored in the pending returns for that specific address. And then we update the highest bid to the bid amount and the highest bidder to the bidder and we return true. So we say, yes, we had this update. But as you can see, there isn't too much different to what we've done earlier. It's basically um, from the functionality point of view, it's still the same as we uh, have done uh, when we have created our earlier functions for the auction contract, okay? So that's the update bit. And then we have the reveal function. And we are gonna start with a super simple version where we assume that there is only one bit for any given address. We will change that later on in the exercises. It will be one of your tasks to actually allow for multiple bits for each address. But right now we're going to assume that in this struct array, there will only ever be one bit for each address. Okay, that's the, the assumption for our first iteration of this contract. Now we have right here, the function reveal. And of course, when we're revealing, we have to reveal the actual values. So we have the bit amount, we have the Boolean is legit. And then we have a call data string. And here you can see we're using call data instead of memory, um, because it's a function argument of a external function right here, with the name secret, okay. That's Basically what you need to recompute the hash values, that's basically the information you need to evaluate um, the uh, 
um, validity of the bit and also if it is the, the newest high spinner. Then we have a UINT we call refund. Um, we're defining here. And the first thing we do is we have a new bit. We are gonna, uh, we are just uh, the, the location, that location is storage and we call it bit to check. We load the first element of that struct array for the specific address, where the specific address is the message sender. So basically the first element right here, zero happens to be the first element. Um, and recall that our assumption, our working assumption initially is that there is only one bit per address. That's why we can hard code the zero right here. Okay, that's the idea. And then what we're doing is we have this bytes 32, we call it hashed input, and we uh, use the generate sealed bit function we have created earlier with the argument bit amount is legit and secret to create the hash value. And of course, this time the inputs are the parameters we have from the function, from the reveal function. So whatever you, you send alongside the reveal function call will be used to create the hash value. And we do that, that, that we are able to compare whatever people have specified as function parameters, as arguments when they call the reveal function to uh, what has been committed earlier. So we're using these arguments, hash, hash them, uh, and then we compare the hash value to what has been committed earlier. And that's of course what you do with commit and reveal. You compare the hash value from the commit step to the hash value from whatever they are revealing in the reveal step. And that way you can make sure that it's actually, that it corresponds to the same. And then we proceed with if bit to check dot sealed bit is equal to hashed input. So that means when the uh, um, uh, commit step hash value is equal to the real step hash value, uh, then this bit is successfully revealed. And then what we're doing is temporarily we're storing the bit to check deposit in the refund variable, okay? Of course, we will process that later on. We'll make sure that not everything is refunded. So this terminology might be somewhat misleading, but we're just temporarily storing that in there, okay? Then we proceed, we say, okay, if is legit, is true, and also bit to check dot deposit is larger equal to the bit amount, which is of course also important, then the bid is valid, okay? These are basically the two conditions you have to fulfill to make sure that your bid is valid. Um, then we say the Boolean success will be the result of update bit with the parameters message sender and bit amount. Recall that when we have specified the update bit function, then at the end, you will get a one or a zero back. So it returns this Boolean value. And this Boolean value we store in the success variable right here. And this success variable is then used in this if statement. So if success is true, that's just the short version of that. So if success, then what are you gonna do? You take this refund you specified earlier and you deduct the bit amount from it uh, because obviously you're not gonna refund that um, the bit amount when it is uh, successful. Then we have to prevent the reclaiming of the same deposit. And we just set the bit to check dot sealed bit to a zero um, value in bytes 32. You make sure that it cannot be uh, used again. And then last but not least right here, uh, we say if the refund is larger to zero, then we take the message sender address, make it payable and transfer whatever is still left in the refund, we transfer it back to the message sender. So basically as a, as a refund, refunding this person, um, that's, that's the last step. Now in our initial version, we did have the severe simplification that we said each user, each address can only have one bit. And that's of course a simplification that you shouldn't count on in reality. I mean, there is no reason why we should have a restriction in place that each address can only have one bit. And if you wanna allow for that, so if you wanna have addresses with multiple bits, then you have to iterate over all the bits of that given address. 
You first have to understand that Solidity supports most of the control structures you know from similar languages, such as JavaScript, for example, and it also uses similar semantics. And for loops we will use in this case, and they are usually used to iterate over arrays, and that's exactly what we're going to do here. Here you have the example. So you have an array uh, of type T, and then you have the for loop where you're saying, okay, we initially have UI and TI, which is equal to zero. The condition is I is smaller than the array length, and we increase it with every iteration. So basically we do it as long uh, as this condition is fulfilled. And uh, then you have the body, uh, the, the for body where there's some, where something happens, so where you basically can uh, um, do something uh, in this for loop. So anything you can think of basically can be here in between. Um, and that's just something that repeats and repeats and repeats it, uh, over and over again until the for loop ends. Continue will jump to the beginning of the next iteration and break will end the entire loop. And you also have things like uh, while loops uh, or do loops. Uh, so you're not stuck with the for loops, but uh, many cases for loops are the most common ones and certainly the one we will use for this application right here. The only thing remaining is to end the auction and to implement time constraints. So we need basically some way of um, a resolution mechanism where we end the auction, where we def again define the winner, where we find down to S1. And we could do the time constraints in a similar way to the simple auction contract, but you can also do it um, with uh, modifiers, with custom modifiers, because you don't want to just repeat these checks. When you have the similar checks over and over again, you just can, can uh, program them once in the form of a modifier and then reuse them. Custom modifiers are convenient. Um, it's something that you cannot only use for, for these time checks. It's something that can also be used for access checks, for example, when you, when you have certain addresses. And it's certainly something you that can, will come in handy when you're developing your own program, when you're developing your own protocols. Now, how are they specified? Well, you say it's a modifier and then uh, you give it a name. You say only before you have a UINT time as a parameter right here. And then you have a certain check. For example, here you have require that block timestamp is smaller than time. You have this error statement right here, which is too late in this case. And this underscore semicolon uh, specifies whether the um, whether the mod whether the check so the the condition is checked before the rest of the function or after the rest of the function. So this basically is the, uh, this is a representation of the function body. So whenever the rest of the function will be executed. So when you have the require statement before that underscore semicolon, that means that you're checking the condition before the function gets applied. Whereas when it would be uh, the require statement after the underscore semicolon, um, then the uh, function would be executed first and then the require statement would be checked afterwards. Okay, that's the idea. You could also have uh, only after, which is of course quite similar to uh, the only before, except for the condition. So here with the condition, you have the block timestamp must be greater than time, and you can say, hey, it's too early. Okay, that's the idea. So, Let's finish the contract and what we have to do is we have to add a function uh, to end the auction with the modifier only after. And you can see right here that you have the function auction end. It's an external function uh, because it of course has to be, we have to be able to call it from, from, uh, from, from uh, we have to be able to call it externally. And then we have this only after modifier right here that we have just specified. We say only after reveal end, so that's the time whenever the reveal ends, um, whatever is set as a reveal end time after that, uh, you can call this function. And then we're saying, uh, first of all, require that the auction has not been ended before. So if it has already been ended, then of course you would have the error message and you couldn't end it again, it wouldn't make too much sense. Then we have to emit the auction ended 
uh, event uh, with the uh, highest bidder and highest bid right here, then you set has ended to true to make sure that it cannot be called again, this function, that it cannot be ended again. And then what you're doing is you're taking the beneficiary address, make it payable, and you transfer whatever the highest bid is to the beneficiary address, okay? That's the idea. That's a relatively simple function how you can end this auction. Now, the last thing are the exercises, of course. Um, the first one is relatively easy because for the first one you have everything you need on the slide deck. The second one is a difficult exercise. It's uh, somewhat challenging uh, because here you have to create the um, multiple bit version of the contract yourself. And you have the hints of course in the slide deck, but we expect that you're um, using loops. So the loops we have introduced uh, are coding that yourself. And that's probably the most challenging part programming wise of the entire class. But let's start with exercise 1a. With 1a, we are going to assume again, as we did in our first iteration of the contract, that there is only one bit for each address. So you have to add a function to submit a new bit to your sealed bit auction contract. Then you implement a reveal function in your sealed bit auction contract. And of course, you also add a time constraint to the bit and the reveal and the auction end function. So that's essentially what we have done in the slide deck. And as I said, this, the exercise 1b uh, is the extended version where you allow for multiple bits and uh, you have to extend your contract to allow for multiple bits from any given address. Uh, and of course you have to do that with loops so that you're implementing loops that iterate over these multiple bits for each address and uh, check um, and process them all. Okay, that's the basic idea. And with that, let's check out the solutions in Remix. All right, let's get started. And uh, our starting point is actually the contract state from the previous video. We're going to build on that. And the first one we're going to do is defining a struct. We call it bit. And uh, in this struct, we have various elements of a bit. So the first thing is a bytes 32, which is called sealed bit. And then we also add a UINT, which is the deposit amount, because the bit essentially consists of these two things. Now, the next thing we're going to do is creating a mapping from an address to the struct array of the bits. So uh, since uh, we wanna have the flexibility later on that each person can have multiple bits, we're gonna define it that way. And now we have to define some modifiers. The first one we're gonna call only before. It takes an argument which is called time. And what it does is relatively straightforward. It just requires that block dot timestamp is lower than whatever is specified in the parameter. Otherwise, we're going to print too late as a, a error message. Then we have to specify where the actual function is executed. We do that by underscore and semicolon. So it's after the check in this case. We have a second modifier, which is called only after. It uh, also has an argument, which is called time, an unsigned integer, and it requires that the block dot timestamp is in, in this case actually larger than time. Otherwise, we're gonna print the error message too early. And then of course, again, semicolon here, and uh, we have to specify that the function is executed after the check with underscore semicolon after the require statement. The next thing we're gonna do is adding a function. It's uh, the bit function. So we're replacing the bits as an argument. You have a bytes 32, the sealed bit,
this is an external function. It must be payable because you have to submit your bit, the actual value alongside, and it has the uh, modifier only before. And that's the time argument we're using the bidding end variable. In the function body, what we're doing is uh, first of all, bit memory new bit so we have a, a one of these bit structs we call new bit and within that struct we have the sealed bit which is set as underscore sealed bit so as the parameter we have deposit which is set as message value so whatever is sent alongside the uh, actual message in eth And then we have bits for the message sender. So recall that potentially this could be more than one. Uh, we will extend it that way later on. We push the new bit basically on that bits array for the message sender. And that's it. And the next function we have is the update bit function. We have a, an address, a bitter address. We have an unsigned integer, which is the bit amount. It is an internal function. It cannot be called from outside and it returns a success Boolean. So a, a zero or one, uh, depending on whether the bit was updated successfully. Then we have an if statement, if bit amount is lower or equal to the highest bit. And what you're doing is you return false because then obviously it has not been updated. It's not the new highest bit. The old one, the previous one is higher than the current than this one right here. And you have a next check if highest bidder is unequal to the zero address. So in other words, when there already has been a bit before that, then what you do is you refund the previously highest bit to the previously highest bidder. And uh, you do that by pending reader turns for the highest bidder plus equal to the highest bit the current highest bit, so before the update. That's essentially just what we have done before, so it's the exact same thing. And then you have highest bit equals underscore bit amount. So this time you're gonna change it. And also, of course, you have to change the highest bidder, which equals underscore bidder. Last but not least, you return true. So in this case, you indicate that it actually worked. The next thing we're going to do is adding the reveal function, the simple version of the reveal function. We will update that in exercise 1b. It takes an uh, unsigned integer, underscore bit amount as argument, also a boolean, underscore is legit, and the string. Here, don't forget the call data location, and it's a string, and an external function, and it's underscore secret. Here we have the external argument for the function. Here we have the modifier only after. We use bidding end as the uh, time parameter and only before reveal end as the time variable for this modifier right here. Then we add the function body and what we have there is an unsigned integer called refund. We have a, a, a destruct uh, that we call bit to check, oops, bit to check. 
and uh, we set that equal to bits of the uh, uh, message sender and we take the first element of that array of the specific message sender so element zero we add the comment load the first bit of the transaction sender then we set the hashed input it's a bytes 32 object and we set it as the result of the generate sealed bit function with the arguments underscore bit amount underscore is legit and underscore secret then we have an if condition if the sealed bit of bit to check is equal to the hashed input then uh, uh, do something then we know that it's actually the same what you have committed and what you're revealing and what we're doing is bit is successfully revealed so that's the comment we are adding right here and here we have the action so we're setting refund to bit to check dot deposit and what we're also doing is we're checking if underscore is legit and that's again the short form for if is legit is true and bit to check deposit is larger equal to bit amount then we do have a valid bit so let me quickly add the comment bit is valid and the way we handle this is we have the success boolean and we set it equal to update bit with the arguments message sender for the address and underscore bit amount for the amount all right, so we basically update the highest bidder and the highest bit. Essentially, that's where we're going. So if success, again, short form for if success is true, then bit is new highest bit. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to have refund minus equals, or we're going to deduct it from what has been in there previously underscore bit amount and then we have to make sure that it cannot be essentially double spent so double claimed to prevent people from reclaiming it and we do that by setting bit to check dot sealed bit equal to bytes 32 zero so then it's not this hash value that's stored in there anymore. Then it's just a, a essentially a, a bytes 32 object of zeros. If refund is larger than zero, so when there is a positive refund, then we set the message sender address as payable and we transfer the refund amount, so whatever is remaining to this message sender address, essentially as a refund. Then we have one more thing that's left to do. We need the auction end function. Recall that we have deleted that the last time because I said we have to re-implement it. So function auction end. It's an external function, doesn't take any arguments or parameters, but it has to restriction the modifier only after and only after the reveal end time. And then in the function body, what we're doing is, first of all, we check if it has already been ended. So we require that 
it has not, that's the exclamation mark, it has not already ended. And uh, if it has already ended, so if it has ended is true, then we say auction already ended. We're going to admit uh, emit an event, the auction ended event that we have defined uh, up there with the highest bidder and the uh, highest bid. And then what we're also going to do is, of course, has ended. Uh, we're setting that to true so that we know that we it has actually been ended. Last but not least, we make the beneficiary address payable and then we use dot transfer and we transfer the highest bit to the beneficiary that's basically the resolution all right so the last thing we have to do is to test the contract let me jump up really quick there we go and then compile everything so let's go to the compilation tab and make sure that we are on the right compiler version, compile the contract. There are no errors, so that's good. And now we can deploy it. We go to inject the web free. We should be on Robston. Let me quickly check that. Here we go, Robston test network. Um, and now we can deploy it. We have to set the uh, arguments in the constructor. So we copy the address from our account one, that's the beneficiary. Duration minutes, uh, duration bidding minutes, we set to five. Duration reveal minutes, we also set to five. And then we can transact and confirm the deployment transaction. Let me quickly check the transaction status. And uh, we jump to EtherScan, and here you can see it has already been successfully confirmed almost immediately. So we go back, and the first thing we're gonna do is, here we look at the deployed contract and we change to account two. So we use a different account. Uh, here we don't have too many fonts, so we will make a really small bit, but that's okay for the demonstration. Uh, and the first thing we do is, of course, we have to generate one of these sealed bits. We set the bit amount to 0.01 ETH, uh, one followed by 16 zeros, that is in way, is legit, is true. And as the secret, we just use the word secret with a capital S. Here we have the hash value that is resulting from the sealed bit, uh, generate sealed bit function. We use that hash value uh, as an input for the bit function, and that's our first actual uh, execution transaction uh, where we are executing a smart contract. Of course, you have to make sure that you're sending the value alongside the transaction, so we copied the value uh, put it up there. We could also use a, a larger one, of course. And then we're transacting. You can see the value and we are sending the sealed bit alongside the transaction. Now, oh, we can already see it's confirmed right here. So we don't even have to check on EtherScan. We already have the confirmation. So that's fine. Now, if we want to reveal it, uh, we are going to use the same amount. So again, 0.01. We say, again, it's legit. And of course, we're going to use the same secret, which in our case is just secret. And when we click on it, we will see an error right here. Uh, the error that we're too, oh, and there is a typo <laughs> in too early. I have to quickly fix that later on. Um, let me actually fix that right now. Too early, where is it? Right here. All right, so the typo won't be there anymore when we redeploy. And uh, regarding the waiting period, we can apply a uh, fast forward thanks to the power of video editing. And here we are. So we can try again. And this time it's going to work because the uh, five minutes have passed. So we have confirmed transaction. We can again check on EtherScan. Let me quickly go there. Here you can see the transaction or reveal transaction. And it's still pending. It's going to take a while. Uh, 
And then after a while, it will get confirmed. And that's the case right now. You can see success. All right, let me quickly show you the address. Here you have the uh, commitment transaction six minutes ago. I can see right here um, where you have the uh, blinded bit. And that's the hash value we've generated. Let me go back quickly again to account two. You can see 40 seconds ago, that's the reveal transaction. Uh, unfortunately, this cannot be decoded right here, um, but you can still see the values uh, in here if you're looking for it. So everything pretty much we have revealed alongside the reveal transaction. So the next thing we would have to do is uh, we would have to end the auction. Again, obviously it's not gonna work because there is a timer we set that the reveal phase will be going on for five minutes. Um, we also can of course not bid anymore uh, because that would be too late. So that's not gonna work. Um, so what we're doing right now is we're switching back to account one because account one um, will in our case end the auction. That doesn't have to be the case. We're just gonna do it. And then uh, again, we're gonna fast forward. And here we are again, the five minutes have passed. Let me check again, and this time it's gonna work. This time we can end the auction, so we have the auction end function. We confirm it, and we are gonna check it again. Oh, it already has happened, but we're still gonna check it on the uh, an ether scan on the Block Explorer that we can see the details of the transaction. And you can see right here that these 0.01 ether have been transferred to the beneficiary address. So it's a success. The last thing we do is we check the has ended and we can see here it's untrue. So the auction has successfully concluded. All right, so for exercise 1b, what we have to do is we have to modify the reveal function. So that needs to be an array right here. We add the call data storage location. We call it bit, bit amounts. We do the same for the Boolean, say it's R legit and also call data right here. And then for the string, also we already have call data right here, but we call it secrets. So you have to make sure that there are multiple entries possible. Then we add a unsigned integer, n bits, which is just the bits of the message sender, the length of it. So you use bits message sender dot length. And then we require, we have some sanity checks. First of all, that underscore bit amounts dot length must be equal to n bits, so that that is the same length. Otherwise, we're gonna say invalid number of bit amounts. We're gonna do the same thing for our legit, so underscore our legit dot length must be equal to n bits. Otherwise, we're gonna say invalid number of bit legitimacy indicators. And then we're also gonna do the same thing for underscore secrets dot length, where we're also saying it must be equal to n bits. Otherwise, if that's not the case, once again, we're gonna say invalid number of bit secrets in this case, okay? Then we have to change the refund to total refund. And we have our loop right here. So we're gonna say for unsigned integer i equals zero. 
whenever i is lower than n bits we're going to iterate over i we're going to increase it and then in each iteration we have a struct a bit struct which is called bit to check and this is simply the bits of message sender more specifically the if element of it and then we set the bit amount and the is legit and the secret equal to underscore bit amounts the i-th element again of that so that it's whatever we have in the current iteration also underscore r legit again the i-th element of that and the same for underscore secrets also the i-th element so we, we store these values um, in the uh, bit amount is legit and secret Next, we have the hashed input and uh, we set it equal to the result of generate sealed bit with the function parameters bit amount is legit and secret. So these are all part of the current iteration. Uh, we have just defined them. And with that, we can check if the bit to check dot sealed bit is equal or in this case we use the unequal is unequal to hashed input so what we have just computed as a result right now and if it is indeed unequal then of course it will fail uh, so we can have the command failed to reveal bit and uh, in that case we will also not refund so do not refund deposit and continue with next bit so we're simply gonna use the uh, continue statement right here and, and move on to the next iteration then we have to add to the total refund so we use plus equal um, we're not overriding it bit to check dot deposit and uh, add it to total refund then we have another condition we say if is legit and also if bit to check dot deposit is larger equal to bit amount then what we're doing is we set the boolean value success equal to the result of the update bit function with the function arguments the parameters message sender and bit amount then we have to check one more thing if it is actually successful so if success is true then what we do is we take total refund and we deduct the bit amount because in that case it should not be reflected in the total refund in that case it's the highest current bit so then we can remove uh, right here up until this comment where we say prevent reclaiming and then we have to adjust the refund right here to total refund then we have to do the same thing right here also total refund uh, otherwise it's the same as in the previous version now with that we're ready to try to compile the contract so click on the compilation tab click on compile you can see it compiled successfully no errors now i'm not going to show you the contract in action again because we already did it for the previous one this is just an extension and otherwise the same all right congratulations that's it for the basic programming part there will be some more programming videos later on uh, with tokens for example and also when we tackle uh, some of the advanced topics uh, but that's it for the introduction and with that we are ready to go to decentralized finance stay curious see you soon